Hello, hello. Um, so thank you, uh, Liz. Thank you, Tishna. Thanks to the whole Power to Pixel team for uh, allowing me to crawl out of my cave in Brooklyn and, and be here today. Uh, it's very nice. Um, so um, there's a Jewish proverb that goes, uh, what is truer than truth? And the answer is the story. Napoleon once said that uh, history was a series of lies agreed upon. Perhaps it was bitter. Um, perhaps it was true. It was true of pop. It is true of popular history. But my goal here today, and just not just talk about my project, but specifically try to um, make the way you think about history completely change. I want to sort of promise you that by the end of this 30 minutes, you're going to rethink what you know about history entirely. That's my promise to you. So. Um, when I was 11 years old, I read Gone with the Wind. Um, I was in Iran, uh, it was Tehran, it was five years after the revolution, four years into the Iran-Iraq war, and uh, I found my solace in stories and books. Um, right after I'd finished the book, I went to, sat at the dinner table and I slammed my fist on the table and my dad was like, what the hell is wrong with you? And uh, first I got punished for bad behavior and then for reading a romance novel at the age of 11. Uh, and then I got the usual uh, uh, lecture, which is, all good books come to an end, and there is always other good books, and that's the good news. And for me, that wasn't sufficient. I wanted more of the same story. It wasn't enough to just to go to and move on to another story. I wish you could call me a bit more involved in the one story that I had. And I really liked Mammy's character. Um, that was the slave, uh, house slave that ran the plantation house um, uh, in Scarlet's house. I loved, uh, I wanted to go to war with Rhett and Ashley uh, and I wanted to experience that, and I, fought, and I wanted more of that story, and I couldn't have it, and I, and I just wasn't happy, and that's why I was so pissed off. Um, you know, I knew that the Civil War was about the emancipation of slaves. I knew it was a his great historical event, and I felt like the story didn't give me everything I needed. It was a fantastic story. I liked it, and that's why I was angry. It wasn't because it was a bad story. But I wanted more, and that, I think, is, a, is the theme uh, of here. Um, and th this is when I started realizing that I have a problem. Um, my uh, experience as a junkie, uh, as a story junkie specifically, has been an experimental one. I've been in conflict zones. I was a cinematographer of conflict zones. I've produced feature films. I've uh, made dramatic TV shows. Uh, I still shoot and create installation art. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's been an experiment that has gotten so much lovelier in the last few years because the, in, the environment for storytelling has expanded so much. Um, but really, I think what's true is that I was trying to make a career out of my uh, condition. Uh, and, uh, and finally, I feel like I'm finding a place to do that. And I founded Boomgen in 2006 with my partner Reza Aslan. And essentially, uh, I'm getting tweets, so that's good. <laughs> um, um, you know, I've worked on studio picks, I've shot, I've shot a lot of stuff, but with BoomGen, what we were doing for the first four years was, was a service entity. We were working with studios to shape creative, and then in 2009, we began to, to develop uh, strategies around um, uh, audience engagement. And so we would, and, and our goal wasn't the same thing. It wasn't just promotion. It was about trying to pull the story out of the creative and extend it into the conversation around the content. And by do, in doing that, we were able to bring millions of people to content. So in the process, we'd learn how to um, work on really good creative, but also we'd learn how to bring millions of people into a conversation around content. Uh, but what we hadn't figured out was how to uh, convince private finance to give us enough money so we can do our own projects. Um, and that's, um, I think uh, uh, the reason why we decided to leave the film business and uh, get into the story business. Um, because we need to be more efficient, we need to be more resourceful, and we need to be able to expand our market potential. And uh, just like the investors, we couldn't trust uh, uh, the film, the economics of the film industry. And that's just the fact of today. Um, so we think of story as a cow. Uh, and we think of storytelling as a way the French cook a cow. Um, if you think of a story in terms of uh, delivering a filet mignon at a fine restaurant, there's a whole lot of cow that's going to go to waste. Um, and, uh, and that's just tragic. And, that, and the waste is conflicts, characters, storylines, context, tears, laughter, things that should not go to waste. And any story junkie can tell you that. Um, 
But there's more than that, because that may seem obvious, and that may seem nothing new, but there's a hell of a lot more that's on that factory floor. And I think that's the, the main reason that we want to talk about. So one of the biggest key global trends right now is the intersection between interactive media, entertainment, and education. Um, there is a number of indicators that are driving this trend. Here's a, bu here's a bunch of them from Ernst & Young uh, that came out just a few weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and I think this is really, really important part of this. And we believe storytelling is at the center of this trend, and we believe history is at the center of is its nexus. Um, but a single layer story just cannot accommodate this fully, right? So let me go back to my example in the beginning. Gone with the Wind still today is uh, the highest grossing entertainment property, property of all time, when, it, when adjusted for inflation. It beats Avatar twofold, uh, if you add book sales and everything to it. Um, but my, you know, and so obviously it doesn't need any help, but I say that it does, and this is how I say it. So if I could, in some fictional, really cool planet, have my way with this property, what I would do is I would create an interactive graphic novel in the iPad based on Mammy's story, where the story of Scarlett O'Hara would be the backdrop of her story. And you get to see from the perspective of a slave woman who lived in a southern plantation and her family what the Civil War was about. I'd create a game, not a shoot 'em up game, but a game that would allow you to experience the cultural, major conflict, cultural transformation through conflict. Um, in the American Civil War through the perspective of, of Ashley and Red. Um, and what does this do? By liberating, um, from, by liberating the story from a single narrative, all of a sudden what you've done is that you've created value and meaning. And I think this is really the core, the core point here. Is that all of this activity in this space, whether it's transmedia or cross-media, or just storytelling, is, is at the end of the day meaningless if it doesn't have value and meaning, and that's my opinion. Um, so it has to be entertaining, but that's just not simply enough. Um, so what is Operation Ajax? And that's essentially the project that I'm here to talk about and what we're working on. So in 1952, uh, Time Magazine's Man of the Year was Iran's Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. Uh, he was a peculiar man. He wore pajamas in public, like Julian Schnabel. Um, and, uh, uh, and he often gave cabinet meetings from bed. Um, he had come into democratic power through popular support and had pushed the, his popular support in order to be able to nationalize oil at the ex, you know, in the face of the Shah, the Iranian monarch, and at the expense of British interests. And obviously the British were happy, very happy with that. Uh, at the same time, America was on top of the world. It was post-World War II, uh, and uh, America was leading the charge uh, along with the Soviet Union in, in global influence. But America really believed morally that they were in a, in a battle with, with the spread of communism and the Soviets, and that really would, had captured the American mind at the time. Um, then, uh, in 1947, Truman uh, had uh, announced the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was basically uh, very simple. It said that any enemy of the United States, if any, if any enemy of the United States attacks a sovereign state, um, then they're attacking the United States directly. And that was a very bold uh, statement. And essentially what they said was, and they put the CIA in charge of that mandate. And the CIA at this point was meaningless. It didn't exist, and this was really what they had to do, and they, they didn't do much, to be, to be honest with you. Uh, but they were tasked with countering the spread of communism and, uh, and, and Stalin, uh, and Stalin's push out towards the West and elsewhere in the world uh, by the spread of democracy and capitalism. Now, if you recall, Iran, uh, at the time was just south of the Soviet Union. And so it was immediately within the Soviet sphere, and here's a young democracy. And so naturally you would think that the US would want to help. And Truman for a long time resisted the, the British calls to interfere. But eventually, um, things changed. Within a year, US media was calling Mossadegh a, a, a ruthless dictator, and the CIA was knee deep in an operation, its first ever operation for regime change. Uh, which then became a sort of a modus operandi, and they repeated elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and that was Operation Ajax. So what we do um, essentially is what I call sustainable storytelling. And I think you know, we can learn a lot from the sustainability environment, because that's the big thing that's missing from the film industry, for sure, but storytelling in general, that it's not sustainable. And if we intend to be in this business and really do it well and actually provide meaning, 
we have to first be able to answer the question as to how is it going to make this, how are we going to make this sustainable. So let me sort of show you the first layer of the project, which is a graphic novel uh, that was created by uh, Cognito Comics, Daniel Bergen of Cognito Comics, Mike DeSev of uh, Gorilla Animation. It's based on Stephen Kinzer's uh, international bestseller called All the Shaw's Men, and is powered by a technology created by Tall Chair in San Francisco. So let's check this out. Audio. Audio. Booth. No booth. Did we disconnect it? Introducing Operation Ajax for the iPad based on actual events of the CIA's involvement in overthrowing the Iranian government. A bold and original interactive graphic novel that redefines digital comics and the art of storytelling in 210 handcrafted pages. Navigating the comic is easy and intuitive. Tap or swipe to read the next page or to go back. Touching the middle of the screen gives you more control and lets you dive deeper into the rich history surrounding the story. At the bottom of the screen, we can flip through pages. It's also easy to jump to different chapters. A handy guide can be called up to provide a synopsis of the cast of characters. Occasionally, you'll see a star while reading. Touch it to pull up additional information about key story points. Historical documents that have only recently been declassified and even newsreels from the era. Operation Ajax by Cognito Comics. Experience it at the App Store. Sorry about that. Um, so um, the graphic novel came out um, in the end of last year, it's uh, done quite well. Um, it's uh, won a bunch of awards. Uh, there were, you know, it was a Webby honoree for best entertainment on the mobile tablet space. We beat out Marvel and uh, uh, and uh, DC at CES for the best mobile application of 2011 in the mobile app showdown at CES and and a bunch of other things. And so it's been a good start. Uh, so uh, Daniel Bourbon comes from a gaming design background, and he wanted to figure out how to tell the story uh, using his game design techniques in the iPad, uh, which at the time when this whole thing began had just been released. Uh, Mike's, um, Mike's actually won a bunch of nominees, uh, Emmy nominations, because of his amazing work on Beavis and Butthead. Uh, uh, and, uh, but he's a really good writer, and, uh, and I think Beavis and Butthead is actually a really good example of how good of a writer he is. Uh, um, and, uh, and Tall Chair is a technology company out of uh, San Francisco that has a, created a publishing tool called the Active Reader, which runs on top of Unity, which if you're in the gaming business, you know it's a gaming software. And, and this is what uh, is the environment in which Ajax was created. And I suggest that you guys check, check them all out. Um, the next layer of the property was the academic edition. And this was, was for us very, very important. Uh, so we knew we had something that was really entertaining. It's a really cool spy thriller, but we knew it had an academic uh, 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 use because uh, the next generation isn't going to read history like you and I read it. It's just not going to happen. And so storytelling is, is going to come back to the environment in which uh, you're going to create uh, educational value. And so, uh, so we're just running the, the, the pilot of the academic uh, edition now. Uh, it's quite exciting, to be honest with you. We, we created a 90-page uh, research dossier that's going to get incorporated into the app. So the academic version of the app is going to be a monster app that's going to include, A, much more sources than Kinzer's book, uh, but also it goes far deeper, both into early CIA history and the, and the world environment in which provided the, the, the environment for this operation to happen. Um, we gave, have given this to uh, the people who are doing the pilot. So this is the kids at Nueva, which is a eighth grade students at a, a school in Silicon Valley who are uh, piloting it now. These actually literally came in two days ago, and I just put them in here, uh, of the kids uh, learning with this. And they're actually debating uh, the coup uh, on November 9th uh, in their school, in front of their parents, which is quite exciting. And this was their idea to debate it. So imagine eighth grade students who want to debate a coup in Iran in 53, and that's what I mean by power of storytelling as an <laughs> academic tool. Um, we're also piloting it at UC Irvine to undergrad students, uh, and we're talking to an international school in Holland uh, to pilot it there, and I'm looking for someone in London, and that'll be the end of our pilot program, and then we'll launch this at the beginning of la next year. So what's interesting about this is that 
there's some interesting about interesting mergers, the, uh, crazy mergers happening in the, uh, in the technology space with the educational market. And, and, and I don't know, it's rumors if it's true or not, but until there is a time where you can actually sell licenses to universities for content, um, you uh, are not going to, uh, you're gonna have to sell it on the app store. So this means that we can sell the same app for a much higher price to story junkies and academics and students everywhere. And that's sort of, and we have direct distribution to them through the app store, Google Play, and Amazon. The next <clears throat> is a game. When I was a, <clears throat> when I was a kid, um, it was a, in third grade, there was a, a pinball machine that my friend had that basically was different. No paddles, and you gotta get the ball in the slots. And, and, and the ball went through the course and fell into a slot. And if you think of the course of the ball as history, all the other pins represent possibility. And this is exactly what we're doing with the game. Uh, we've got a team of academics working on all the reasonable choices that were made in that history. Uh, that would have had a meaningful outcome, and we're bringing that into a gaming space where you can go into that history and try to change its outcome. This is a high-level strategy game for the mass markets, but it also has crazy academic implications. And uh, we're working with Chris Klug at Carnegie Mellon, uh, who's a game designer, who's also doing a board game version of this thing to create the app. But what this does is that it makes, you know, because, look, the CIA's role, uh, if, you know, you're either the CIA near nearest chief or you're the prim prime minister of Iran. If you're the CIA, you have to prevent a communist takeover of Iran. If you're the prime minister, you, need, you want a sovereign democracy with an economic independence. And those two things are extremely difficult because of the Soviets, because of the British, and because of the Shah. So it's very difficult to accomplish it, which means as a player, you go in and you make history your own personal agenda. And this becomes your mission as to how you want to play this game. And the sky is the limit. And the data that's going to come out of it is going to be fascinating once the, once the gamers get into it. But also, it's going to change completely the way we respond to history. Um, this is some of the, sort of the gameplay uh, visuals uh, that we're working on. Then there is the film. Um, the film is very much, uh, it's an animated feature. Uh, we're gonna start shooting, uh, start working on a 60 week schedule in the middle of next year. And it's from the CIA perspective and it's a straight up film. So if you've heard of Argo, uh, this is the origin story to Argo. When the, when the, uh, when the hijackers uh, hijacked the, the, you know, the, uh, the U.S. diplomats in, in Iran in 79, they said that they wanted to prevent another Ajax from happening. And so this truly is a, a, the origin story to, to, cargo, to, to Argo. And, uh, and this should be out in two years. So it sort of brings us back to this idea of a life cycle. So transmedia, in, in what I have a problem with so far in a lot of things that I've seen, is that it has a very short life cycle. And we, in, we, in contrast, have a much more methodical and patient approach. Our projects could, would take five years to come to fruition. Uh, but, but then, essentially, what we do is that we run six, seven projects at the same time. And so that allows us to keep busy and really focus on each layer of each different ones and cross-market them. Uh, at the end of it, obviously, the visibility is going to happen around the film. But by the time you get to the film, you've created market awareness. You've, created a, you've reached a much wider demographic base, from kids to older people uh, who, who, who knew this history or who actually know about the Cold War and, 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 and what that meant to their lives. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's a symbiotic relationship, and that's very much what it's about. Uh, it also allows us to reach uh, markets that are beyond uh, our reach otherwise. And, and if you look at, you know, for us, storytelling is, is not just a play here in, in the English-speaking world, but also in the growth markets. And the growth markets is where all the spending is going, and the growth markets is where um, people are hungry for storytelling that's different than the usual that's been happening, which is sort of what we're, we come in. Um, and if you even look at the data that's coming out, it's kind of crazy. And this is sort of what shocked me, that actually Iran was the, was the fifth uh, fastest growing app market in the world. And, you know, you just, I mean, we couldn't believe it, and I'm Iranian, that's just shocking. Uh, so storytelling, made up of story and made up of telling. It's not just about content creation, it's also about content delivery and thinking about content delivery strategies. So if you wanna be in the storytelling business, you've gotta think about both things. And I think Wendy was saying this before, is that the role of the producer has to change, and I think that's true of Canada and, the US, and, and Europe, but in the US we have a thing called the creative producer, and I think um, that's essentially what happens. You know, that's what I do, I'm a creative producer, and I work with the writers, I work on the creative, and I, in the transmedia space, I'm sort of the connecting tissue between all the layers. And I think creative producers are the missing link that I see elsewhere because so, so much between creative and, and production is separated and you need someone who can think both ways uh, to run a project like this. Um, so, you know, the, I wanna end by sort of quickly telling you about uh, 
what one of my advisors actually says this a lot, is that you know, he says that we figured out how to monetize the film development process. Um, and, uh, and it's true, but we think of it more as uh, sustainable storytelling, as I was telling you. Um, but we think that it will pay dividends, not just for fans, um, and not just for, uh, for in the education market, and, and not just for us, but I think it will pay dividends for our investors, because it just makes business sense to do it this way. Um, but none of it matters if we actually can't provide meaning and value, and that's, I think, the key point here, is providing meaning and value. Uh, as the Jewish proverb goes, you have to be able to get to the truth, closer to the truth if you're in the, sto in, you know, if, if the story is at its core. And, uh, and for us, it's running a bunch of different projects at the same time that allows us to make this sustainable overall as a company, but also sustainable within its silo that we work in. Um, this approach can be taken for any history. You know, that's the amazing thing, right? In the last 50 years alone, the history is a treasure trove of, of triumphs and, uh, and, and sad stories like this one. But even when you go deeper in a story like this that may seemingly seem sad, what you realize that it's so much more than that. And I'll quote my father, who taught me a long time ago that the history's value is trapped uh, in its potential to teach us a lesson, but it's also uh, in our ability to move beyond our grievances. And I think that's a really important part as to why as storytellers, we should think about no longer being uh, a, in a place of trying to settle scores through, uh, through creating content, but rather to heal. And, and, and our role as healers, I think, is the most important thing. And I think if we think of ourselves as storytellers that are trying to heal and accept the vast space that storytelling has, has encompassed, then we can figure out what the, what the roles and strategies are uh, to take. And I think the story is what told us, in this case, what the platform strategy should be. Uh, and I think history is a really good way to experiment and figure out what a platform strategy should be. The story will tell you the answer it told us, and, uh, and it's been a very rewarding uh, path so far. Thank you.